Hi, good afternoon. Um, so, okay, working with the laptop orchestra. Um, we started, we started uh, this laptop orchestra at Concordia in uh, 2011, just a year, a bit, uh, like a year and a half ago. And uh, there was a question what to do with it. You know, and th there are laptop orchestras around, uh, around the world. Definitely uh, the most, uh, probably the most known one is uh, the Plork, uh, Princeton Laptop Orchestra. There is one in Stanford. Um, and there are a few in Canada that's been uh, sort of uh, popping up you know, uh, in, in recent years. Uh, McMaster has one, uh, um, in BC they have one, in, uh, in Calgary they have one. Uh, small ones and they're always changing. Uh, but in terms of what to do with the laptop orchestra, and, and you know, there is no repertoire, or there's no standardized repertoire at least. Um, I don't know if there, there needs to be one or not, but it's another question. But I think um, the kind of things to do for me, is, as, I, as I've seen it from the beginning, is really a, um, a situation kind of a, uh, uh, you know, situation by situation call, right? Piece by piece call. What do we want to do? How do we get it done? Um, and the approach that I've been taking with the orchestra since uh, last year has always been improvisational in a way that, yes, we prepare material, because it's a little bit hard with, with laptops not to, 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 uh, to play if you don't prepare anything, right? If you don't have anything, what do you do? Just uh, the beeps, the volume beeps. I guess you can make one piece out of that. Um, but there is always some kind of preparation, and that preparation can be can can go to uh, to different extents. Um, it can be uh, obviously preparing materials, having some sounds to play, and be ready to play them. Um, sometimes it can be something larger. Sometimes it can be um, like a real sort of pre-composition plan. Um, but even in that um, in that context of having a pre-composition, a descriptive score, that's what we've been using. Um, it's not really micromanaged to the level of, you know, like uh, I want this voice exactly a third above the other voice. I don't want necessarily disharmonization. Or, you know, there is much more room for, um, um, you know, by its nature in the, in the laptop orchestra and by the, the style of music, there is more room for, uh, for, uh, for free improvisation or structured improvisation. So, you know, for. For me, like uh, piece by piece, this has been a, a, um, kind of a, a learning experience. And you know, usually, what I like about using descriptive scores is that I can basically compose a piece in ten minutes. I have, you know, I, I can have like 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 what you do in a pre-composition. If you write a piece uh, for instruments, and you can have a plan written down pretty quickly of how things begin, how they end, and then you go down, you, you sit down and write it, and you write every single voice and you write every single. Uh, textures and you write the orchestration and that can take a long time but basically the piece is in your mind already so with descriptive scores and working with descriptive scores with an orchestra the work is a little different I find that after 10 minutes the piece is basically done now let's go and do it and uh, doing it is a lot a lot of it is basically um, on the go so usually what hap what would happen I would write my students uh, an email telling them okay this is the plan I want you know this group here to prepare some you know, low sounding drones, rumbles, right? I want uh, you guys to prepare some high frequency uh, continuous sounds. I want you, you know, this group to prepare some um, pointy list, some uh, clickety, you know, some whatever, and any kind of uh, thing that, f that fits within the plan of the, of the piece. And I would ask them, I, I want uh, specifically for you to be able to change the timber when you called for in such, such a way. I want to be able to uh, definitely respond to dynamic, uh, dynamic differences, to respond to, uh, to be able to start and stop exactly when you're told. Um, so basically preparing all the material to be ready, and the material is not only the sounds themselves, but also the actual processes and, and the controls, what, what, uh, uh, what is possible to do and, and how quickly. Um, so I think I'll start by showing you such a descriptive uh, score, which is, it's hard to call that a score. It's basically um, a, li a little story. You know, in 10 points, we start doing this, move on to doing that. But it is what, uh, what this, uh, this piece, Concerto Fortistic and Laptop Orchestra, is about. It's um, specifically, we'll hear this, we'll hear this piece in a, in a second, but what, uh, how this worked 
there was an idea that thrown in the air by a professor, a friend, Mike Pinson. I said, like, oh, if you have a laptop orchestra, why don't you do something very traditional in nature? Do a concerto. I said, all right, it's kind of cool. And um, I, I uh, talked to um, DeAndre Stewart, an artistic performer who was um, in, in Concordia at the time, and I said, uh, well, we're looking to do a concerto for orchestra, laptop orchestra. Would you, be, would you like to be a, a soloist? He said, sure. He said, sounds interesting. He's performed the artistic before, but not with a full-size laptop orchestra before. And um, another friend, uh, Professor David Dogborn from McMaster, brought his orchestra, and we basically did a, a concerto for two or laptop orchestras and artistic. And so this was the beginning. And I basically emailed this plan, these eight steps, um, oh, sorry, it's actually 13 steps, just didn't fit well in one page. But basically, I, I emailed this plan to all involved. And I said, oh, right, like that's, that kind of looks cool, um, looks balanced, everybody gets to shine. You have, uh, you know, each orchestra has its moment, the, the, the soloist has its moment. Um, and it seems to be pretty interesting in terms of, uh, um, like differences in, in, like in texture and it develops uh, interest, at least on paper, if you imagine what you, you read it and you imagine it. Um, and Andrew prepared um, a graphical uh, representation of that. Basically this thing, right? So, you know, this wouldn't mean much without the description but it gives, well, it gave me as a conductor on, on in the performance the ability to actually sort of know where I am, well, you know, and sort of move on to the next step. And there was a discussion whether we should have specific timing for each one just to have like more kind of a safety. But in general, I found that having specific timing ahead of the performance uh, kind of is, uh, you know, is a, is missing the point a little bit of an actual performance. We, we, in, you're in the performance, after two minutes you feel this is enough, you want to move on. You don't want to wait for 2.55 exactly just because it says so on the paper. You're right now, you're in the moment, you feel best right now what's, uh, how this, you know, whether this works or not. Um, and, um, you know, in the same, same in, in other times, maybe something developed slow, more slowly than you, want, than, than you uh, planned and you want to extend it a little farther because just musically it feels um, more appropriate at the moment. It is a performance, after all. So in some ways, I said that you know, working with a descriptive score, you don't need to micromanage the detail ahead of time, but often when you actually perform, you do, just in real time, right? Something is too loud, you ask it, you know, you, you, you're, you're bringing it down specifically at this moment. Something accelerates too fast, you slow it down, you know? So, there is this still level of management, but it, it happens in, in real time. Okay, so I'll, I'll play just uh, an example of a uh, few minutes of, uh, from that piece.
Jump ahead a little bit, it's a long piece. bring the, uh, the piece to conclusion here. <laughs> yes. So you don't have to clap. It's already done. Already done. Anyway, so, um, so there, you know, there are different, uh, different aspects uh, here that, uh, that, you know, in composing the piece that we're th we were thinking about. And some of them is having a soloist, or actually multiple soloists, not just a soloist on stage, but a soloist from each orchestra. Um, and you know, there are many many considerations when you uh, when you perform with a laptop orchestra in, in terms of communicating with the audience. You know, the audience can basically, if you don't do anything, if you don't think about that, all the audience sees is basically just a bunch of guys and girls, mostly guys, sitting and you know behind the laptop and doing something. And there's some music coming out of multiple speakers, but the connection is not easily made. It's not like uh, performing a, an acoustic instrument, and it's much more visible. You know, you're not behind the thing, or if you are behind it, you know, it, your body moves, and, and, it's, and it's very, uh, and also we know, we know the instruments, right? So we know if you're doing something, if you play a saxophone, <coughs> except for, sorry, <laughs> except for moving uh, your fingers. Um, okay, this should be closed. So except for moving your fingers, um, you're also moving your body, you know, we expect some gestures, some very specific gestures. You bring the saxophone up and you play a high note, a long high note. You don't really need to do it, but we kind of have a, langu a body language already that we're used to. There's no such thing with laptop. The body language you know is basically this. Um, it's, it's not interesting enough, right? Um, or it, m it may have been interesting the first time it was done, but then it was, okay, so what now? All right, so... Um, and you know, I, I don't know if we have an answer for that. It's every piece by piece we have a, um, a kind of a, we consider this aspect. But one thing that uh, that we decided to do um, was to work um, with sound painting as a conducting technique. And sound painting was not, as far as I know, uh, used uh, with laptop orchestras before. At least not in a, you know maybe occasionally, but I haven't seen any uh, documentation for that. But it's quite possible it was. But we've adapted that as the, as the way for basically communicating in real time. 
Um, it's not just, you know, uh, like a, it's it's not like traditional um, con uh, conducting that uh, that guides a prepared piece for the most part. This is more a, compo a, co a compositional tool, real-time compositional tool. Um, sound painting initially was uh, created for jazz uh, performance, but also with dance and theater. Um, and um, the Walter Thompson Orchestra, basically what they do is, you know, uh, Walter Thompson is kind of like he plays on the orchestra, right? They, they're ready, they're very, very responsive to all of the uh, g gestures. There are about 800 gestures in this language. We don't need that much, obviously, for a laptop orchestra. And every piece, we may, m we may need some that don't even exist, and we make up some. For example, in one piece, we had uh, kitchen sounds. So, you know, there was no specific uh, gesture for playing kitchen sounds. We just made this. And, and it was clear, okay, now you play kitchen sounds. <laughs> but um, what it allows, it allows a control over um, kind of like transport control. Start, stop continue. Um, sometimes I can ask, you know, ins instead of just like pointing at someone and saying, play, I can actually scan through and whenever the hand hits you, 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 you play. And so it's a kind of interesting visually uh, thing to see, like the hand pointing at something and then that something plays, or that a person and that, that, per that person plays. Um, and there are different ways of asking to, st to play and to stop. Stop right now, finish your idea, or exit gradually enter gradually. So it allows a lot of um, real time. It's basically, I can actually talk with the performers in real time through the sign language, but it's camouflage as, as performance, but I'm really actually asking them, do that, do this, right? Um, so it worked very well for us. And also I find it's, it's, it also works well in, uh, in giving the audience something to look, to look at, something that actually, some kind of motion that connects with the, with the music. And sometimes it connects more than others. I think that in that performance it was okay, but in some performances it's more clear, you know, like when something uh, happens. And the, uh, like in, in one piece we had like uh, explosion sounds. So basically we agreed on something like this. And every time this gesture came, a big explosion came, you know, it's, then it's visually kind of interesting. And it's almost like, uh, you know, how much time do we have? Five minutes? All right. Okay, so um, now the other um, the other thing I wanted to uh, to talk about briefly is telematic performances because Concordia Laptop Orchestra has done a lot of that. It's been a, a big a big part of, uh, of its performances, um, and telematic performances basically include um, either other laptop orchestras or other individual or sometimes other jazz ensembles, uh, chamber ensembles um, in different cities, and. You know, it's basically like a large ensemble that is spread all over the globe. And the, the uh, considerations for composition and um, improvising in this uh, uh, medium is, are very similar, except there are more problems because we're not visually connected, or we, you know, if, even if we're connected through a video, um, it's not strong enough for conducting, usually, especially when you're talking about like five or six cities playing together. So, um, what we've done, and I'll play a little bit, uh, another short example from a, a piece um, called Density um, that was, all right, one second, here. It was also scored in the same manner. And I'll let it play and I'll also describe at the same time just because of time considerations. So if you see that the level is, uh, is too high, you can bring it down. Um, so basically here, there were five cities, um, Belfast, Hamburg, New York, Montreal, and uh, San Diego. And we were the only laptop orchestra. The rest were uh, acoustic instruments. Um, and each location composed a piece for the entire large ensemble of about 35 performers. He performed there too. <laughs> he joined the orchestra uh, just for this performance. And um, here, what was interesting is there was one on the screen, you can see actual, the actual description. It was projected and basically on every location. And, and we had, uh, we did have like a, a, another one network specifically for score that was basically just 
um, well, we'd have a score of a piece, and sometimes a, an actual cursor going on, it would go with the same, the same for every city. It was, uh, it's, we used something called Quintet, and the uh, developer was actually one of the performers, he was in Belfast. Um, so, I think what's interesting here is that this descriptive score was guiding very similarly to what we do with, uh, with the laptops, but all instruments. So instead of actually writing notes, I would ask, for example, play, uh, you know, play, you know, improvise on thirds of each other, something like that. Um, but it was still only descriptive. I didn't write any note. The graphical score for this one looked a little bit more rich just because of how many instruments were there. And the description was just all over the place, but the same things were considered. Just allow everybody to come through at some point and have a kind of a balanced um, um, like development and, and of, of different textures and, and overall intensity. There is some story behind, right? Okay, so. Maybe I'll, I'll stop here just of, uh, because of time, and I'll just uh, like to, uh, to answer questions if you have any. Um, there is another thing that I wanted to talk about, but you'll hear it tonight at the, uh, the Laptop Orchestra performance, which is more actually working in, in sync and actually making metered uh, beat-based music with a group of large um, like a Laptop Orchestra and actually maintaining sync. But this, um, well, if you, if you wanna, if you wanna, I can actually, you know, if you have questions about specifically this, I'll be happy to uh, to tell you. But uh, otherwise, you'll be just able to uh, to see it happen tonight. So, questions about what you saw or anything else? So when I think, uh, why have laptops in an orchestra, um, and what happens? is that every laptop sort of turns into an instrument. And then that has many levels. For example, one is people forgetting about how many things they can do at the same time with the laptop, which is limitless, and just focus on one thing. That's great. And the other one that you mentioned is the theatrical aspect of the audience being able to pinpoint and be like, OK, that guy did this, that guy did that, this person did that, this person did that. And having gestures helped a lot. Uh, but the third part is perceptual which is like if you close your eyes and what does it mean to have a laptop orchestra? And that's a spatial aspect of how s sound is distributed in space. Mm -hmm. And I guess the way pr Princeton started was that each person had a solid bowl speaker where it was point source, and but yet they had like multiple speakers so they could radiate yeah, in different like omni, yeah. directions. And you could close your eyes and still hear a person and then look at it and see what they're doing. And I was wondering just what are your thoughts and if you're, um, how you're dealing with this aspect of uh, the laptops or are you planning to implement that in the future? Because it takes like a few days to make a uh, solid bowl speaker, for example. Sure. I like, I like this approach. Basically what he's talking about is you know, the, the idea that if, if it is an orchestra, you don't want to hear it from loudspeakers. You want to hear it from where they play. right? And uh, that's what uh, Princeton Laptop Orchestra did. Each, each laptop was 
uh, you know, each station was basically the same. They had the same speaker, with this hexagonal speaker that projects in all directions. Um, and it's in the space. There's no, they're not, they were not connected. They are not connected into like a, an amplifying system. They're just playing from where, they, from where they are. And spatially, you actually hear this large mass of instruments coming in front of you. And that's, I find, to, I find it to be very effective. At Concordia, we haven't done it this way. We still, you know, it's, well, for one thing, we had a very large orchestra, and there's 26 people. And we don't have that many speakers. So if we do, we'd have to bring them from all, all the rooms, you know, and it would also be a little bit too much, I think, to have like uh, 26 speakers. I don't know if it would make a difference if you have 26 or, or, or 20 or 15, you know, in terms of how we actually perceive it. It's still like a big mass. Um, also, the ones we do have that to use individually are just, I felt, you know, uh, we're not good enough in terms of um, using, uh, you know, we could use basically guitar amps to just have this aspect. But I felt that the, uh, what we'd give up in terms of sound quality would not be, um, would not be worth it. Um, and another thing is, it makes telematic performances much harder. You know, if in telematic performances we felt, you know, like we're basically, for the most part, sending two or four channel signals, right? So um, if we're already sort of set up to go into a system, um, and we, we do play with multiple speakers, and usually that speaker will be near you, but sometimes, that, you know, it'll be near four people, and four people will be playing from that speaker. Um, so, you know, we didn't ignore it, but um, we kind of worked with what we had and what we need, which was a little different. Le we, we have less of these large sort of uh, concert hall performances, except for that one with the T-stick. Most of them happen, happen at the uh, EA classroom, which is a much smaller space, and most of them actually, or at least half of them, are telematic. So a different situation calls for a different thing. I have a question about the audience, and especially in the multi-city telematic performances. Um, what is the relationship of audience and players? Um, Malcolm just mentioned in his opening talk that it, improvisation makes the audience sort of uh, participate. Um, and it seemed to me that the room was very small. So uh, are all the players their own audience? Or is this some, uh, how would you see it? I mean, there are many constraints. The audience doesn't s visually connect with each venue and so on. So what were the thoughts around this? Yeah, there, there are a few, a few thoughts here. Once, one thing is, uh, one thing we did to approach this um, sort of audience performer communication was we don't want any more audience there, performers here kind of thing. Um, so to begin with, audience that, that do come to the local um, uh, performance, um, we ask them to sit inside the orchestra. So they can actually sit, you know, you can just sit near one of the performers and basically see what they do, what they do in real life just from behind the screen. Um, another performance we did recently was, was with dancers. We asked actually the dancers to dance inside the orchestra and the, and the audience to walk inside the orchestra. It, it can be a, da a little dangerous in terms of cabling, but I think it's worth it in terms of actually just forcing that connection in a kind of a different way. In terms of the telematic performance, it's funny because every location has its own audience. And they view the others in the um, in, in the video uh, screen, um, but I don't know it's it's still a very disorienting experience. I have to say, like you know, when the when the piece ends and everybody claps and you hear claps from multiple speakers coming, you know, Belfast here, New York there, you know, and like, and um, and you you're not. I, I don't feel yet that there is a clear connection, but there is just kind of like a strange experience in many ways. Um, and I find that what's the actually the biggest exposure aspect of this is not even the local audiences in all of these places. It's much more, you know, webcasts and, uh, and, and, and especially uh, podcasts, what happens after. This usually, is, I find, is, you know, nowadays uh, with this kind of um, per uh, performances, it's much more valuable. Just an example, I, uh, I, like recently uh, I did with Ricardo, um, uh, this big telematic show uh, around the world, like 23 uh, locations, 23 cities from New Zealand to Hong Kong to Germany, Norway, Argentina. And people came, maybe five came to the show. It was a six hour, six hour long jam session. Maybe five came to the show. But on the webcast there were 400 people. You know, and, and the kind of community that was, community that was created around that was very active and very, very um, enthusiastic and, and really good. But they just didn't have to, you know, to actually come 
leave their homes and actually come and see it. They can just, you know, ex experience it. In, yeah, in some limited way, perhaps, from the webcast, but it's how it goes. It actually does happen. You know, it's, a, it's an internet-based uh, um, event. Most of the audience is on the internet, and I, I think it's fine. Um, have you thought uh, that visually it be might be more interesting if you would collaborate with a dancer or a choreographer as a conductor, so that, well, the movements would be a lot more elaborate and, and interesting, um, it could be improvised. So this kind of movement would be uh, would be a sound, and then this kind of movement would be a sound. Yeah. So that visually it it it, uh, it it could be a bit more interesting. But the, there'd still be a score, but you'd give the score to them, and then they'd dance it. But they'd, they'd be flexible, but they could still play with the the way they move. Sure, I like the idea. Basically, there's something in sound painting that is kind of like that. Basically, just. Um, gestural, you know, it's like there's no, forget the language, now what I do, you play, right? And, and you can basically give that to a dancer, it'll be much more elaborate, and they have to respond, you know, the, the performers, it doesn't have to be laptop, it can be any kind of uh, performance, um, respond to just movement in a more kind of um, intuitive way, it works, it works well. Um, I'm just interested in, in how on the one hand the laptop orchestra and telemetrics open up these new possibilities for relationships between audience, composer, conductor, performer on the one hand, but on the other hand the kind of language of the laptop orchestra seems to reinscribe a very old-fashioned model. For example with the um, concerto for T-stick, I noticed at the very end you call the performers performers, not co composers, so sort of like you claim the compositional rights, they're the performers, where it seems like the vast majority of the sound structure, as you say, is really performer-driven. So I'm just wondering how you think of, on the one hand, these new kind of possibilities, while at the same time, for pragmatic or other reasons, sort of still inscribing, you know, a kind of musical hierarchy that you might think was appropriate for precisely different kinds of ensembles and instrumentation? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. I, mean, I, think it's, I think it is a piece by piece kind of uh, decision to make. You know, this piece specifically was kind of like borrowed from the traditional concerto. <laughs> you know, and, but I'm, I'm not completely 100% you know, uh, sure with the us usage of the term performer as, you know, versus uh, co-composer. I mean, they, they are co-composers, there's no question. Um, um, but maybe performer, just in the word itself, this already means, I mean, if, even in traditional music, like all the actual music comes from the performer. You know, what's on paper is just, a, it's just in theory. <laughs> you know, the performer is really the one to create the actual, um, yeah, the actual music, exactly. So, you know, I, I, uh, it's a language kind of thing, you know, that I, I can't really make a, make a decision. Um, but... I say it's piece by piece because, you know, sometimes the piece, just how the pieces are created, how the pieces are created is based on somebody's idea. Sometimes it's, you know, somebody says like, even uh, like in that Hug the World uh, performance where basically people just jumping in into the performance all the time. And somebody just said, why don't we do something like, uh, the Ar Argentinian team who said like, why, why don't we do something like call and response? You know, like it's, it's a, maybe it's a little too busy. I want uh, everybody sort of like, you know, respond to each other kind of in a, Great, great idea. So Sweden said fine, and Greece said fine, and Hong Kong said fine. Then basically they started something that was just sort of happened, right? And, uh, and so who, you know, there's no composer there. <laughs> it's, it is really a group thing, right? And um, I don't think we have necessarily like a, you know, any kind of standardized language to even describe exactly what happens. <laughs> but um, uh, I think, you know, we... We, we do it with, with this open mind, the idea that, you know, somebody throws in an idea and you build on it and then, some, you know, it gets sort of, it rolls like a, like a snowball in some ways and it grows into something you don't know where it started, right? So, yeah, we borrow from the tradition a little bit because that's where we come from, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but we stay, as much as we are capable, open to uh, anything that comes our way. Could I, yeah? Uh just carry on briefly on that theme, or do you want to move on? 
Well, it was really just, you know, because one of our themes in a couple of days is the social forms. And I think in a way Eric has started that one up. And it, it was really also relating back to Navid's point, because, of course, it isn't just that these are social forms, so that by rein reinventing the hierarchical orchestra, if you were doing that, you know, you're reinvoking, you know, a certain form, a certain social form that music ensembles take. And, of course, there are other forms. So the jazz orchestra has always had a different set of internal social dynamics. And the point about that is that the musical results are radically different. And the point about, I guess, the individual speaker setup is that, uh, in principle, it, it makes possible, you know, a different kind of musical interaction and, and, and sonic results. And, and therefore, what, what I liked about what you were saying, Ola, was you were very experimental about the audience relations. <laughs> but I guess what I'm interested in is inviting you to be equally experimental in being conscious of those social relations of the ensemble and, and indeed the way that the sort of the setup, uh, like the use of speakers in particular ways, can, can allow that or make it very difficult and occlude the individuality of, of, sure. of players. It doesn't mean it's necessarily better. It's being conscious of, of those, you know, those potentialities. But I think because our theme is comprovisation, I, I was left with a kind of crucial thought, which is if we're only interested today, which maybe we're not, in when composition meets improvisation, which was your point about descriptive scores and so on, maybe we, we're wedded to certain rather hierarchical forms. And that's a, that's a big issue. You know, maybe compromisation has built into it uh, a certain limitation on the distribution of, 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 of the, uh, the, the degree of distribution of musical creativity. I don't know. I agree. I think it's a, it's a very important point that, uh, that sort of uh, I'm happy it, it comes up. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it, can, it can lead us in, uh, in our thinking in, in, uh, in a good direction. And yes, I agree. You know, when, when the Laughter Orchestra began, my friend uh, Kathy Kennedy asked me, like, so how are you going to make sure it's not just a big ball of noise you know and then you know i came with some kind of like a careful structure there is sound painting you know like at least i have some control and with sound painting i feel actually what what works it, do, it doesn't have to be sound painting any any kind of a communicative uh, sign language um yes sometimes i don't need to uh, to get involved sometimes it's great but i want to be there to be able to mix <laughs> oh it's too loud here okay you know high high notes down in level you know and then like, you basically just sort of shape it in a way you how much do you get involved? Sometimes more than others. Um, you know, and sometimes you just let it roll, see what, see what, see what happens. That happens too. Um, and some of it is talk. Sometimes we stop. Okay, so what worked, what didn't work? Um, what can we do? And, you know, it is a group thing, but I think it's good. Maybe it is traditional thinking, but I think it's good to have somebody to make a decision <laughs> eventually. You know, collect all of the things together. I think it makes more... Um, some like some kind of more um, coherence, you know, in, in, in the the actual musical performance eventually. But uh, even that, I'm saying, and I'm not completely comfortable. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you very much.